The theme for our week has been Christian memory and witness in a time of violence. And I think if you've had the opportunity to listen to some of the talks or through the whole series, I'm sure you will have noted some things about Professor Gatti. You will have noticed, I think, the impressive breadth of perspective that he brings, that he is a very careful listener, an honest and precise thinker, and a remarkably clear and adept communicator in different contexts to different audiences. He's someone who is on top of his scholarship, but is also deeply committed to moral formation and to action on individual issues as well as thinking through broader structural issues. We've listened to Professor Gushy expound on the certain kind of Christian Christianity that can inspire courageous moral action in solidarity with the oppressed and with the marginalised. We've also heard him reflecting on his experience of contributing effectively to public life on issues that really matter, issues actually of life and death. And last night, we had a broad introductory kind of overview to a central theme in Jesus' teaching. David teased out the kingdom project as the key to Jesus' teaching and a paradigm for Christian interpretation and Christian action. And so those different dimensions of what Professor Gushy has been talking about and reflecting on in a way weave together tonight in tonight's address, which focuses on same-sex relationships. And we all know, I think, that this has been a tremendously fraught and painful area for many people for different reasons, particularly in, in recent years, within the church but also more broadly in society. <coughs> It's well known that Professor Gushy has changed his mind about the issues at stake. He has come to be an outspoken advocate for full acceptance by Christians and others for LGBT people. Indeed, it was that issue that Mike Hosking talked to him uh, this morning about in uh, one of Hosking's characteristically um, in-depth uh, <laughs> radio interviews. Um, tonight, David will walk us through his journey, teasing out the biblical, theological, ethical and pastoral issues as he sees them. What does a kingdom ethic and faithful Christian witness look like in relation to this area? Professor Gushy has distinguished himself as somebody with important things to say and someone worth listening to very carefully. At the conclusion of the talk, there will be lots of opportunity for questions and answers. As you listen, and listen carefully, I hope that you'll also take the time to think carefully about how you might frame a question clearly, respectfully, and succinctly so that we can make the best of that time at the end of the talk. But for now, would you join me in welcoming Professor David Gushy as he concludes our series with tonight's lecture, Changing My Mind, Theology, Ethics and Same-Sex Relationships. Well, welcome back. Thank you for coming out uh, for my last lecture, and thank you, Jeff, for another very thoughtful introduction. And uh, Alistair, both of you, for all that you have done uh, to make this experience so rich for Jeannie uh, and for myself. So, some of you, this is your first uh, time to hear me. Others, it's your 101st, it seems, probably. Uh, uh, but. W Whatever brings you out tonight, I, I hope and pray that um, what I have to say will be edifying, illuminating, and helpful um, to, to where you are on your journey. Um, I am aware that the issue of what the Christian church should make of 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, that, by the way, that's my fundamental concern, the people, not the relationships, um, but what to make of LGBT people and also perhaps of the relationships that some make uh, is, is indeed fraught, and it is a global issue of controversy in, um, in Christianity and in a number of societies. Most every society in one form or another is having some kind of debate about this issue. It's funny, G and I uh, traveled you know, 8,500 miles to get here, and in some ways the issues related to LGBT people are pretty much exactly the same as they were uh, the, the ones that we left back in Atlanta. And in fact, in, in the week that I've been here, I've received uh, three new invitations in the States to help churches think about these issues. Um, it seems like that's going to be my lot for as long as I say yes. Um, and I don't know how long I will say yes. I'm actually not obsessed with this issue. Um, I've written 20 books. The 20th one was on this issue. I don't plan to write a 21st, a 22nd, and a 23rd on this issue. Uh, I don't want my entire legacy defined by this issue. Um, but this is, this is an issue that I felt I had an obligation, um, and I had the freedom and the responsibility and the obligation to address. And I'll tell you a little bit about the background to that. Um, in this, in this conversation. I will also say by way of um, introduction that this is an issue that it has become impossible to avoid if you are a church leader. Um, pastors, youth ministers, deacons, elders, uh, those uh, in various kinds of authority in the life of all kinds of churches are having to figure out what to think and do about this issue. And uh, a lot of times the obligation to think about these matters comes to churches, leaders, and denominations that are not ready. Um, not well prepared for significant theological, ethical, and pastoral reflection when this issue comes and, and um, uh, if churches are not ready, spiritually, intellectually, often what results is conflict and schism. Um, it is certainly not my goal to encourage, I mean, I think conflict is probably inevitable, schism is not. So, so I, I'm aware of the gravity. I know that here in, in Wellington and in New Zealand, there are congregations and groups of congregations that are wrestling with policy decisions and pastoral decisions and so on and differences of opinion. And people who, who were on the same side on a bunch of other issues find themselves not on the same side on this issue and that's, that's uh, difficult and frustrating and hurtful. Often when Christians uh, differ, this is what I preached about here on Sunday morning, um, the Romans 14 injunctions to love one another and have tolerance for one another, even when you discover you disagree fundamentally about something, uh, begin to erode quickly. And uh, people lose the capacity or forfeit the capacity to live charitably with one another across differences. And uh, sometimes it denigrates to politicking and finger pointing and name calling and uh, finally uh, division all of which we should be able to do better than that if we are followers of Jesus who have the Holy Spirit and the scriptures to guide us. And sometimes we actually do better than that. And my prayer for you all is that you will do better than that. Notice the police sirens are already, you know, out. I, I don't know, you know, who called the police? We haven't even done anything yet, but here we go. So um, let me also uh, say, and this might be a good place to start, um, Though I myself have moved along a journey um, that I suggest has had uh, four points. You might say I began with a, what I'll call a traditionalist perspective. I moved to a kind of a modified or moderate traditionalism. And then I, I moved to a place of being deeply conflicted and not knowing what to think. And then finally moved to a, to a place that is sometimes called a revisionist perspective or a full acceptance perspective. I know people at each one of those points on the spectrum today. Traditionalist, moderate traditionalist, conflicted, and revisionist or full acceptance. And I have respect, deep respect for, for the ways in which people are wrestling with these issues and, and for people who end up in different places. 
Um, sometimes the best thing, you know, at least a helpful thing is to map the landscape. What's actually going on? What are the major, what are the major points on the spectrum? And I hope to do some of that tonight as well. So, as I tell you about my own journey, I do not intend to cast dispersion on other people's journey, just to tell you my own, which is what I do in the book, which I call Changing Our Mind. Um, I have been uh, teaching Christian ethics uh, for 22 years, uh, and the way I begin my story is to say that uh, when I began teaching Christian ethics in a Southern Baptist seminary in 1993, um, I, had, I had no particular expertise in issues of sexual ethics, but when it came time to teach about sexual ethics, I took a traditionalist perspective, which is that, the, that God's design for sexuality is uh, one man and one woman in marriage for life. Um, I, I did have a, a significant interest in the problem of divorce which I consider to be actually one of the, the, probably the most important sexual and family ethics issue even to this day. And an issue um, in, that affects uh, in our country about 40% of all marriages. And I still think that divorce is the most important issue and if we really wanted to be talking about an issue that affected a lot of our children and um, our families, we would be talking about divorce. But we don't talk about divorce much in part because the church proved uh, to be not terribly effective in dealing with the rise in divorce rates beginning in the 1960s and 1970s. And not, not knowing what to say and not having much effectiveness in preventing the rise of divorce within the church, we pretty much fell silent on that issue. Um, but, but from my perspective as somebody who has a very tender heart for children, uh, I would say that divorce is actually the most important issue in the area of family. Um, some, would, some would say it's domestic violence. You could put, certainly put that there as well. Um, but instead, what we really are talking about is what happens to about 3 to 4% of the population. And I think that's telling. I think it's easier for us to fixate on 3 or 4% of the population than 40% of the population, or 100% of us, as we struggle to make and keep our covenants. So um, I'd be happy to talk about those issues. In fact, I, I wrote a book called Getting Marriage Right in 2004 that was really about um, a Christian theology and ethic of the practice of lifetime marriage. And that is really a passion for me. Having taught far too many children of divorce in college and seminary, I would like to see us produce fewer of them in our Christian families. So when I began teaching ethics in 1993, to the extent that I had thought much about family ethics issues, I had thought mainly about divorce. The issue at that time was, uh, though there were some in evangelical Christianity who were beginning to think about uh, what to make of the phenomenon of homosexuality, it was not a, a major subject within uh, the communities that I was a part of. So when I spent the one or two days in class talking about sexuality, I took the traditional perspective. And um, there was no particular consequence for doing so because there were no openly gay people in my classes in 1993. Um, it also is the case, I now realize, that if I had had any questions about the traditional Christian teaching about this issue, um, it would have been unwise for me to surface those questions. Because for, uh, for many, uh, uh, church people, pastors, and academics, especially in Christian settings, to even begin to raise a question about that issue is to risk losing one's job. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that I only really began to think about this issue from the ground up when I moved to a setting in which I was permitted to do so. I wasn't mandated to do so, but I ended up being permitted to do so and ended up having experiences that led me to do so. Um, at the time when I began teaching, and for the 15 years that I taught the traditional view without much hesitation, I assumed that this issue was a sexual ethics issue alone. And that's how a lot of people think about it. And, and in fact, I'm always frustrated by, framing, by, by the framing of this issue as about same-sex relationships. Because um, to me, that's issue number 29 of about 30 issues. The first issue is coming to grips with the reality of the existence of people who are not heterosexual or who are not cisgender, as we say, related now to gender identity and gender expression. And the church uh, has, 
has uh, really struggled to come to terms with this particular population that is in our midst and that we have not been able to, uh, to engage. But, I, but, so, but because I, at that time, did not think that I knew anybody who was LGBT, uh, the issue was not a matter of burning significance for me. As I look back, I realized that where I did my PhD, Union Theological Seminary in New York, um, it was a very liberal school and it had a number of openly gay students and faculty members. But at the time, as a young, fresh out of Southern Baptist Seminary student, I literally was unable to process what I was seeing around me at that time. It was the late 80s, early 90s, and, and I just identified openly gay people who were Christians who were around me as as just kind of anomalous. I didn't, I didn't really read the literature that they were producing or that they were reading, and I just bracketed that off, which also, by the way, is where a lot of Christians are too. Um, there is a, a now a 40-year body of literature on the LGBT-related questions, but many Christians are not familiar with any of it, haven't read any of it, um, haven't wanted to read any of it, have been disturbed by the very idea that it exists. And in the late 80s, early 90s, um, I had not read any of that literature. So um, from 1993 then, when I started my teaching career, until about uh, 2007 when I moved to Mercer University in Atlanta and Macon, um, I, my career didn't intersect too much with uh, sexual ethics issues, but where it did, I took the conservative line and I mainly focused on preventing divorce. When I moved to Mercer in 2007, some anomalies began to challenge my perspective. These were completely unexpected. I did not move to Mercer thinking this was now going to become an issue for me. Mercer, uh, the Atlanta campus, um, is about 15 minutes away from, one of, from a community that has one of the largest LGBT populations in the South. It's Decatur, outside Atlanta. And that was where uh, we ended up going to church at First Baptist Church in Decatur. And it was really in this church that I began having the, the gaps in my life experience with LGBT people begin to be filled in. Um, there, there began to be a, first a trickle and then a larger and larger number of devout Christian, gay, and lesbian people come to our church. Um, how many of you know devout Christian, gay, or lesbian people? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you knew, would have thought that you knew devout Christian, gay, or lesbian people 15 years ago? Okay. It's fewer. 25 years ago, it would be even fewer. Okay. So, they, so I remember uh, the, the first lesbian couple that came to my Sunday school class, and they had an adopted daughter. They were not able to be married at that time in the States, but they were covenantally committed to each other, and they had adopted a daughter and were raising her. And so they were in, I, I teach a, a large Sunday school class at my church, and they came my way. I didn't say, please, I need some experience with gay and lesbian people. Would you come to my class? That, that isn't what happened. Um, they just came to my class. Why? Because they liked what I was doing. What do I do? I teach the Bible and we pray. I just do church. And I learned that lesbian people, some of them just want to study the Bible and pray. And they want a church where they're free to do that without somebody raising questions about the legitimacy of their relationships or their persons. Um, so they came our way. I remember when um, they were trying to decide whether to join the church. It was kind of a breakthrough moment because um, they were openly partnered. They were committed to each other. They were monogamous. They were a family. But they were wondering, in a Baptist church, you walk the aisle and then you turn around and people vote on you. They were wondering how that vote would go. And so they, we talked about it, and we could not imagine that our church would reject this family that we, that we knew, and we knew their character. And so they did join the church, and they were accepted. And that was the beginning of a journey. I mean, first there was one, and then there were two, and then there were four, and then there were eight um, single, openly gay people, uh, some bisexual people who were in a uh, relationship with one person, or, uh, and then partnered people, and, and so on. And, and so... I began to learn some things about what it is like to be a Christian gay person. I learned, for example, that almost all Christian gay people have experienced profound rejection in their lives, often from their families and often from their churches. 
um, I've learned that sometimes this rejection takes the most vicious form of complete family rejection of, um, of the most atrocious mistreatment. Uh, I learned that uh, churches had not provided safe uh, and nurturing places for gay and lesbian people, especially um, the churches uh, associated with, with my tradition. And so many of them had either left church behind or had found other churches, or, and now we're just, they, but they were Baptists in their heart. They wanted to do Baptist church, and here was a church that was seeming pretty friendly, and so they were edging their way back in. There was a tentativeness and a fearfulness waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for somebody to say, you're not welcome here, we don't want you here. And when our church didn't do that, more and more kept coming. Um, friendships began developing. I began, uh, you know, going to social events in the homes of, uh, of uh, gay people and lesbian people, and you know, uh, it was, it was um, illuminating. I kept learning more. My, the body of experiences began growing. And the idea that, that every gay and lesbian person is afflicted by some kind of um, distorted or perverse sexuality uh, that cannot be uh, acknowledged as having a sanctifying or healthy element to it just seemed more and more uh, incredible to me to believe. And, um, and then uh, around uh, 2008, 2009, my youngest sister came out as a lesbian after, uh, I have three younger sisters, after an adult lifetime of depression and suicidality and two suicide attempts. And so my family, which was actually conservative Catholic, um, went on a journey with Katie, and I was a part of that journey, uh, coming to terms with, with uh, who Katie really was, that she had been suppressing all these years, and, and now how to relate to her and, and whoever she might be bringing home for the holidays and, and that kind of thing. And so these are not unusual stories. Probably many of you have been on this journey, but it was new for me. I began getting letters from former students who were actually coming out of the closet to me while writing me letters saying, you know, I loved your teaching, you were very nurturing, but you didn't know that I, I'm gay or lesbian or bisexual and, or transgender, and, and that what you said about those issues was not terribly well informed, and I now want to tell you, I ask you to rethink. I ask you to reconsider. Um, for the sake of future students who you'll be teaching, a lot of people look to you, so please pay attention to what you're doing. I began reading more, uh, I began uh, having people approach me saying, you know, uh, you're a pretty visible Christian ethicist and, and would, would you consider um, some other voices? Um, a, a guy uh, named Mitchell Gold, who's a, a furniture guy, um, had, had edited a book of testimonies from LGBT people who had been raised in conservative religious families of all types, Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, Mormon, and so on. And it was 40 stories told by these people. And each of the Miller stories narrative. essentially such that you could begin to predict it. You know, I was devout, I was raised in a devout family. I, I was in puberty or before or just after, I discovered that I was, you know, L, you know, L G or B or T. And, and uh, I, I prayed, I asked God to take it away from me and, and God didn't take it away from me. My, I told my parents and they freaked out. I got kicked out, I got beat up, whatever. Um, I, I wrestled with who I was. I, I wanted to hurt myself. Um, I was bullied at school. Um, I, I, you know, and in one case, Mitchell Gold himself, uh, who came to see me in Atlanta, he's an Orthodox Jewish background, and he said his deal with God was that he would kill himself on his 18th birthday if God had not changed his sexual attraction pattern. And he almost did, but he said, no, no, this can't be right. He has ended up as an activist on behalf of religious people accepting the reality of same-sex people and, and not driving them to such uh, extreme uh, circumstances and extreme measures. Um, I also began paying attention to the fact that as rights for gay people were beginning to advance in the United States and as Christians were defining ourselves more and more in opposition to those rights, that we were beginning to get a pretty a bad name in culture, in American culture. Um, there was a study that came out from the Barner Research Group in 2007 called UnChristian. And it, it was testing uh, secular people's or non-Christian people's perceptions of Christian, Christian people. And um, the, the single most widely shared perception of Christian people was that we were anti-gay. You know, Christian, word association, Christian, 91%, anti-gay. Not, we love people, we serve the poor, 
Uh, we try to, you know, we try to follow Jesus, but oh, Christian, that means anti-gay. By definition. That, that was deeply troubling to me and deeply troubling related to our mission and culture. Didn't resolve anything, but it was, it was one piece of the puzzle. Um, finally, uh, last year, uh, you know, I, I moved in the course of 2008 to 2014 in my own teaching at school to more and more to a position of, well, here's one view and here's the other view, and I'm kind of conflicted. But finally, I decided to work through the issues in a book, and I, I, did, I did this book called Changing Our Mind, in which I worked through the issues and finally concluded that, for me at least, I did not find the traditional rendering plausible any longer, and it was hurtful. And I wanted to try to offer something different. I should say that just as my original view was completely uninformed by the actual experiences of LGBT people, the book that I wrote could not have happened without deep encounter with the lives of LGBT people in their dignity and in their suffering. And I actually don't especially enjoy arguments with straight people about LGBT people. Right, you know, because especially the biblical, let's now argue about Romans 1, let's now argue about 1 Corinthians 6, 9. If it is not informed by life experience with LGBT people, um, then it's almost like we're, we're speaking different languages. Um, now, this raises a theological method question. Should Christian theologians and ethicists have their views changed by the encounter with the dignity and the suffering of people? If you believe that that is admissible material for Christian theological reflection, then you'll be interested in what I have to say. If you think that's not admissible, that everything is resolved by the traditional reading of the six passages, then you'll think that I jumped the tracks as soon as I allowed my heart to get the better of me. And that is actually the debate about my book, really, is, is a lot is, is there. Um, so that's also why I don't really... I'm not interested in the various people who are challenging me to theological duels, right? Pistols at dawn, my Romans 1 against your Matthew 22, you know, and we'll have it out. Because I just don't think it works that way. Um, at least it doesn't work that way for me. So my heart was broken. My, well, I actually moved into a posture of repentance. I realized, I believed, that I had contributed to the oppression of Christianity's own most oppressed group and that I was just simply not going to do that anymore. I existentially moved into a position of solidarity with LGBT people. That I was going to, from now on, reason about this issue in their company and, on, and in, in partnership and in solidarity with them to the extent that I was invited into that conversation. And of course, I then noticed that there was a robust conversation going on among LGBT Christians themselves. And now I was finally ready to engage it. Um, so, so again, um, I, I wanted to emphasize that, that this was a journey that took me from a pure traditionalist view, which I would describe as essentially the six biblical passages settle it. There's a gay agenda to make us uh, undercut traditional Christian teaching that must be resisted. We must stand firm. And we need, maybe need to be nice, but not give an inch. A moderate traditionalism is more like, um, let's welcome LGBT people, but um, not bend at all on Christian sexual ethics. And that's probably going to mean serious limits on what openly gay or even avowedly gay LGBT people can do in the life of the church. A conflicted position is more like uh, torn it's a kind of an in-between place. I don't know what to think. My heart tells me one thing. I think the scripture may be telling me something different. I'm confused. There's a lot of people that I run into like that every day. And then the revisionist or, or a full acceptance position takes various forms. But for me, essentially, it amounts to I will acknowledge the fact in the world that there are LGBT people. They exist at about 5% of the population and they should be treated exactly the same way as everybody else. That's what I understand my position to have ended up being. And be, and be held to the same sexual ethics standards as everybody else. But that gets ahead of the story just a little bit. So, so I wrote uh, Changing Our Mind as a series of essays, one essay at a time, one week at a time, in the summer of 2014. And then I published it in the fall. And the news that this book came out that 
that one of America's leading Christian ethicists had changed his mind on this issue, then hit like a, a nuclear bomb in the American religious landscape. Um, many people were very pleased, many people were very displeased, such is life, right? Um, the, the argument of the book uh, moves in stages, you might say, from a kind of a, a, just start at a default traditionalist perspective and then move along um, on the journey, in other words, I'm basically tracing the journey that I was taking as I was actually writing the book. Um, I started off by basically reviewing some of the history of, um, of how the church has related to LGBT people, what that vocabulary means, you know, some of the basic terminology. Um, all of that is actually more complex than a lot of people think. And I concluded the first section by saying, can we not at least agree that we need to move to some basic mandatory minimums of decent treatment? Can we delegitimize uh, bullying and, um, and uh, hate speech and discrimination, uh, you know, like in public accommodations and, um, and uh, other kinds of, of uh, hateful, uh, and also, you know, really the harshest forms of family rejection and church rejection. Can we, can we establish some mandatory minimum so as not to do further harm at that level? And then, and then I said, some of you, you're going to want to stop there. You're not going to want to go any further. But I want to propose that, that when you're seriously, taking seriously the lives of LGBT people, it may be time to go back and revisit the, the six main passages that have formed the Christian rejection of LGBT people and their relationships. And so I have a chapter on Genesis 19, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, and a chapter on Leviticus 18 and 20, that text that ban male same-sex activity and impose the death penalty for it, and a chapter on 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where you have vice lists that have the word malakoi and arsenokotai and what to make of those terms. Uh, often translated now homosexuals or homosexual offenders, and there are questions about whether that's the best translation of those Greek words. Have a chapter on, um, on Genesis 1 and 2, and I think that actually that's the most important biblical material, together with what we make of Romans chapter 1. And then also have some discussion of what to make of Jesus quoting Genesis 1 and 2 when he talks about divorce in Matthew and in Mark. Um, my overall conclusion is that, um, that reading these passages in view of the dignity and suffering of LGBT people makes a significant difference. We're more likely to notice that Genesis 19 is a story of an attempted gang rape of angels. That Leviticus, a, a book that we hardly ever use as Christians for normative purposes today, um, it's questionable to just pick a couple of verses and use that now. That the translation uncertainties in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10 at least need to be taken seriously. And in general, that the Old Testament ancient Near East background and the, and the Greco-Roman background to what would, what would have been same-sex practice as best we can reconstruct it, um, raise serious differences about, or serious issues about the differences between the first century context and our own context, as well as what we now know about same-sex attraction. I, I do end up concluding that I think for Christians the hardest hurdle to get over is, is the uh, theological account of creation. And for many of our secular neighbors, they just don't get why one of the most ancient texts of the Hebrew Bible that tells the story of how the world was made in grand poetic language would somehow be sufficiently powerful to lead us to reject uh, gay people. But, but I do think, and I, I reflect on this a lot in the book, that Christians lean pretty heavily on the story of God's creation of the world. The Genesis 1 and 2 is deeply reinforced in home and church. God created the world, all the wonders of creation, the goodness of creation. God made them male and female. God made them male for female, Adam and Eve, and the two shall become one flesh. And this is the foundation of marriage, and, and that's where children come from, where babies come from. Very, very primal. I deeply respect and understand why there are many, many Christians who just cannot be persuaded that making space for that five or four or three percent um, 
for whom this is not their story and can never be their story, that there are people who just cannot wrap their minds around that. I get that. And I could not wrap my mind around it until I got to seriously know LGBT people, especially devout LGBT Christians. Um, I end up concluding that if we take seriously the stubborn fact of the existence of LGBT people in the world, and that some are deeply committed Christians who are attempting to follow Jesus to the best of their ability, that we would be better off inviting them into Christian community, gospel, good news, and Christian community of the baptized and the devoted followers of Jesus on the same terms as everybody else. That in terms of their relationships, we should encourage them to make lifetime lasting covenants just as we encourage straight people to. That we should drop their exclusion from family and church and leadership and covenant. And that we can do this based on what we now know about same-sex attraction as confirmed by life experiences, clinical care, psychological and social sciences, and medical professional guidelines, as well as, you know, by the relationships that we are forming and learning from people. That we take seriously the, the profound suffering of LGBT people as the rejected other in our midst. That maybe we understand that what we're dealing with here is a faith and science problem, kind of like wrestling over evolution or a world in which the earth revolves around the sun rather than the other way around, and that we have ways to resolve faith and science problems that can retain respect for science and respect for scripture. Um, that we need to disentangle the life stories of LGBT people and their call for respect and equality and inclusion from a broader narrative of cultural decline that many Christians are working with that goes like this, that Western culture is rejecting God and rejecting the Bible and rejecting Christianity. See, look at what the gay people are asking for. I am now disentangling, I'm asking that we disentangle those narratives. Yes, there is plenty of evidence of cultural decline, but gay people asking to be let into covenant and into the church is not, a, is in my view now, not an expression of cultural decline. It's an expression of a desire to know and be known as, an, as a part of the Christian community just like everybody else. Um, I think we're in a moment of spirit-led transformative encounters with people. There are not too many people that I know who encounter devout gay Christians who have been rejected by the church but keep coming back for more, who are not impressed by them. You know? Um, I mean, think about how complacent the average straight Christian is about church, right? Yeah, come, go, whatever, come to church, whatever, I feel like. To, to, to want to come back to churches that have rejected you over and over again because you want Jesus and you think you can meet Jesus there is very inspiring. So when I hang out with devout gay and lesbian Christians, I find myself spiritually renewed. It feels like the Holy Spirit is there in ways that I, I find completely unexpected. Um, there's something about their hunger to be a part of the community of faith that is very, very powerful for me. I find myself identifying with some of the themes that, that I have been working on in, in my career and that I've been laying out this week, you know, um, the kingdom of God. Remember last night I said the kingdom of God includes justice for those who've had their faces ground in the dust. And it includes in inclusion for those who've been excluded from community. It, in you know, it includes um, healing for those who are, have been in a great deal of pain. And by the way, I take seriously the idea that healing for the vast majority of gay people does not look like sexual orientation reversal. It looks like being welcomed and loved and having a chance to, uh, to, be, to be a part of community like everybody else. So the kingdom of God themes um, strike me as, as very relevant now, and I didn't see that 20 years ago. Um, the idea of, of solidarity with the oppressed that I talked about in my lecture on the righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust, um, that basically when you have a community that is pushed to the margins, that is bullied and rejected, that the call of those who follow Jesus is to stand with them, to, to stand for their welcome and their acceptance, and at least to, to stand for their decent and dignified treatment. At least it means that if you're on the playground, kids, uh, and somebody's calling somebody a name, that, uh, that and the, the people every day call those names, that, that you say, no, that's not okay. Stigma 
bullying, harassment, violence against LGBT people remains endemic um, and contributes to their despair. But in any case, solidarity looked more and more to me like a firm decision to stand alongside and with and in identification with rather than at a distance. I, was, I became convinced that I had been a bystander to the suffering of this community of people and I don't want to be a bystander, I want to be in solidarity with the oppressed. So whether, and also the book that I wrote called The Sacredness of Human Life, in which I argue for the ineffable sacred worth of each and every person. And I have become persuaded that continued second class status at best for LGBT people does not honor LGBT people as sacred. Um, and our efforts to try to find some second best status are ultimately going to fail, not to mention the harder line traditionalism that is, is dripping with contempt all too often. Not always, but often. So the book came out in the fall of 2014, and, and since that time I have discovered um, a lot of interesting things. One thing I have discovered is that there are an awful lot of LGBT people looking for a pastor. And um, Facebook is one place they find me. And so I'll hear from 20-year-old kids, uh, you know, I, I think I'm gay or I'm sure I'm gay and I couldn't tell my parents, my dad's a fundamentalist pastor, I know, you know, so what should I be reading or can, will you pray for me or, or what advice do you have for me? Um, and some of these kids who need pastoring are about 60 years old because they've been rejected for so long and they've never had anybody who's a church leader who would stand up for them. And so they basically just say, can I just tell you my story? A lot of storytelling. I probably heard from at least 500 LGBT people by Facebook uh, in the last you know, nine months or so. Um, I've heard from parents and siblings. Parents go on an interesting journey on this issue. Some parents, when they discover that a child uh, or a child comes out to them as LGBT, um, they reject them utterly and completely. I actually ran into a family um, in California this, this spring where when the gay son, the 20-year-old son of this devout couple committed suicide, they wouldn't claim his body. They wouldn't bury their son because he died in rebellion against God and he, you know, whatever. And, and so actually the friend had to, had to bury, had to bury this boy. Um, so, you know, so anyway, the journey that families go on, most families don't go, don't end up there. They end up learning a lot. They start off with a certain kind of, okay, our 14 year old or 15 year old or 16 year old is telling us uh, she might be a lesbian or, or, or bisexual or, or he might be gay. And, um, and so now I'm going to prescribe prayer and counseling and a continual study of the six verses. And two years later, it's the same situation, only worse, because prayer and counseling and continual study of the six verses have done nothing for this person. And, and so the question is whether the family ultimately gets to a transformed perspective and realize, you know, if we're going to love this child, we're going to have to love them for who they are, not for what we had wished that they would be but for who they have actually turned out to be. By the way, in family ministry, if one out of 20 kids is going to end up LGBT, then we need to be preparing all of our families for the possibility that it might be their child. That for them to be ready to offer something other than the same old, same old that doesn't work. Um, I learned that 40% of the homeless young people on the streets of the United States are LGBT kicked out of their homes or, or running away because they find the environment so abusive, they end up on the streets of New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and Washington, where it does not go well for them, where they are victims of all kinds of further things and also sometimes get involved in behaviors that hurt them. Um, I learned uh, from uh, getting uh, people from the Family Acceptance Project got in contact with me and they do clinical uh, social work research on the life situations of LGBT adolescents. And they, they uh, have studied um, the situation and have found that the more highly rejecting a family is, the more harmful it is for the young person, which is not a surprise. But the most highly rejecting families have kids that are eight times more likely to attempt to kill themselves four times more likely um, to be depressed. Um, I think it's four times more likely to get involved in uh, drug and alcohol or other kind of substance abuse. And, 
and also to be involved in high-risk sexual behaviors. And so in other words, if family reaction to an LGBT young person produces despair, then the reaction is what you get from despair on unwise or, or destructive behavioral choices. So what the Family Acceptance Project, you should look them up, what they try to do is they try to educate teachers, counselors, families to find the best ways to respond to their own young people even if it is not going to involve a theological change but just simply to try to find a repertoire of responses that can help their kids do better and help the family do better. So. Um, I've been inundated with correspondence from family members, from activists, from clinical people, and from LGBT people themselves. Um, I've, I've had various people uh, challenge my exegesis or whatever, and as I told you, I'm less interested in that because I think this is a journey that you go on with the LGBT community, and if somebody's interested in doing that, then I'll talk with them. I have concluded that um, nobody ever gets to attitude or belief change on this issue by reading the big six passages alone. And nor does uh, a diet of reading those passages over and over do anything for LGBT people themselves. But a broader reading of scripture where we read the grand mandates of scripture um, and we sensitively respond to the actual lives of the people who are in our midst. Um, scripture ends up teaching some new things like for example um, uh, the way that the early church found a Jewish movement found a way to welcome Gentiles into the movement because amazingly God was working in them. That the idea that God is not a respecter of persons and, and Peter learning um, I have learned not to call anyone profane or unclean. A lot of people like me are having that experience with LGBT people too. So the Gentile transition in the early church is looking very very relevant to including LGBT people in the life of the church today. Um, a big issue I've learned is, is what people's overall posture is towards the medical and social science and hard science professions. If the biologists, the neurobiologists, the neuroscientists, the psychologists, the social psychologists and so on are saying what you are doing is hurting people and it isn't working, do something different. Some Christians respond to that by saying, oh, a bunch of secular scientists. Other people respond to it by saying, maybe we should listen. What's our overall posture towards the helping professions and the sciences that speak to, uh, to these issues? Um, I, I do have, and in, getting ready to wrap up, I, I do have um, concerns that the church is not going to be able, or the churches are not going to be able to work their way um, to the position that I have arrived at without schism. I hope we can avoid it. Um, I think that there is no alternative to listening to the voices of our own LGBT people in the conversation. And I hope that any congregation that is attempting to have a conversation about this issue will allow LGBT voices in the conversation. Um, to the extent that that does happen, it is usually transformative, if not of theology, at least of mood. Of, of, uh, of, uh, of sensitivity and compassion. Um, I am aware that, um, that there are voices on the left fringe of our cultures that are encouraging kind of transgressiveness and experimentation and the abandonment of all moral rules. And some people think that, you know, that's what really gay rights or whatever the gay people are about. I would say that that's what some gay people are about, but it's also what some straight people are about. What the, the people that I go to church with want is simply to be welcomed into the community on equal terms with everyone else. If they want to make a covenant that is binding and monogamous and faithful, they would like it to be respected the way that a straight person's covenant is. If they have gifts in teaching or service, they would like those gifts to be able to be used the way that a straight person's gifts are used. They just want inclusion on equal terms. And um, I have concluded that that is appropriate and I want to be a part of a church that is willing to do that and I am now a part of a church that is willing to do that. Um, there are these moments in Christian history where people look at the same set of data and they split or they fracture. Um, I am hopeful that if people looked at the, exactly the same set of data that I'm looking at and the lives that I'm experiencing, that they would come on the journey with me. 
but it doesn't always go that way. It's the mystery of difference of perspective. It's just there. Um, I hope that we can live together in community while we work out these issues. I do hope that we remember that as we struggle, there are actual people who are listening, including LGBT people themselves, who every time, every time they hear us argue about this, in a sense, it's an argument over them. It's over their souls and bodies and spirituality and faith and sexuality. And as soon as we can get this resolved, sooner the better um, for, for them and for those who love them. It's their parents as well and their siblings. Um, I don't think this is an issue that can be resolved by sim simple appeal to moral rules or by a, a kind of a flat reading of Romans 1 and, and whatever passages we would cite. It's, it's more complex than that. Um, I do believe that we will one day look back on this issue and the interpretive issues involved the way that uh, we look on other issues where we realized that there were specific passages that pointed in a certain direction but deeper and more significant themes that point in another direction. In my experience in the US, the issue where that is most significantly similar is slavery. Where you have dozens and dozens of passages in which slaves obey your masters, every genre, slavery is assumed or commanded. And then finally, after millennia, some Christians began to see that you cannot really uphold the dignity and sacred worth of each and every person while some people are enslaving others. You couldn't get there from a flat reading of the Bible. You could only get there from the experience of the dignity and suffering of slaves and then a call back to the deeper themes of justice and compassion and sacred worth and human dignity. And that's the kind of moment I think we're in on this issue. And the more we listen to the actual life stories of LGBT people, the more they will help us see it. The path forward for you all. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's up to each and every one of us, isn't it, to respond as we believe God is leading us to. But I was asked to tell my story, and I've done it. And so thank you very much. Thank you, David. Let me just make some uh, brief comments. I know that you'll be interested to continue the discussion uh, this evening, but David, I want to say a few words just to acknowledge what you've done for us this evening. You've shared with us, you've used a number of times the, the term journey, and that's been an experience that has been one of recognizing those around you and coming to journey toward new convictions about the responsibilities we Christians have to one another and to others. So thank you for offering us this experience uh, to help us to think more about the LGBT issues. You've shared how this has been a journey that's been accompanied by friends uh, and opponents. Sometimes they've been the same people, I suspect. Um, you've quite clearly been someone on a journey with the church in the midst of other Christians with whom you have a loyalty to out of a loyalty to God. So thank you for your loyalty to Christ's church and by implication and demonstration your loyalty to us. Those whom you have shared your time and experience and insight with this week. We have benefited from your loyalty. A common thread that we've heard through all the lectures that you've given this week is an invitation to do ethics together by discernment. And in the way that you have used this term, drawing on many real examples, you have been clear that discernment should mean something significant and special to the church. It's not only a process for decision making to resolve ethical problems, discernment is a mode of being. It's maintaining an attentiveness, listening, being careful, holding on to an expectation of understanding God's purposes more and more and imagining the possibilities of how we might live those out together, how we might participate in the building of the kingdom of God. 
So thank you for that encouragement to be a discerning people. In sharing with us, David, you have resourced us to be a community who seek to be faithful to God and finding the way ahead with a diligent approach to scripture and to think carefully theologically. You have encouraged us to see ourselves with a meaningful loyalty to God and to one another as we discern to be real, how to be compassionate, how to seek God's purposes for our lives and for the sake of the world. So on behalf of us all, thank you. I invite you to, to uh, take some questions. As Jeff, as Jeff uh, encouraged us to do so, I, I reiterate that uh, we invite you to make uh, questions rather than statements. I invite you to be kind and to be civil and to be polite in your questions and to do so succinctly. So please, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, when I point to you, you're invited to put your question to uh, Dr Gushy. Sir. Yes, Dr. Gushi, uh, thank you for your address. You'll be aware, June 2014, Alan Chambers, former CEO of Exodus International, the larger comparative mm -hmm. therapy uh, organisation, which covers 11,000 organisations, went into disbandment mm -hmm. because they realised that it wasn't working. What message can you give the church today in terms of the place of reparative therapy? and the, the tools that can be given to people in pastorship and who are trying to guide their LGBT people through the uh, mm -hmm. uh, process of just wanting to be Christ followers. I think that um, the church has, and for the longest time, really wanted reparative therapy to prove successful because it had a, it had a narrative that um, same-sex attraction was intrinsically disordered or sinful, and God is powerful enough to reverse the intrinsically disordered or sinful if people cooperate with God's grace. And, and, um, and so that was the theological base for reparative therapy efforts. And for a while, um, uh, claims about the success of reparative therapy were made that, that we now know far exceeded what was actually happening. Um, I, I do think that every individual <clears throat> experiences their sexuality differently. I also think that the sexual uh, development of the young uh, should be seen uh, as, as uh, more uh, fluid and in, and in development where what somebody is feeling or thinking when they're 14 or 13 or 12 or 15 uh, is not necessarily where they're going to be when they're 25 or 26. But in any case, in the book, I, uh, <clears throat> I applauded Alan Chambers for being honest about uh, the, the um, discrediting of reparative or ex-gay therapy. And I strongly urged uh, Christian uh, ministries, uh, pastors and so on, to refer to other kinds of uh, psychotherapy or pastoral counseling or Christian counseling that would not attempt to do um, sexual orientation change efforts. And I, I believe that many, many people who are on the traditionalist side still have come to acknowledge that that reparative therapy doesn't uh, does more harm than good and should be abandoned. But there are still those who are attempting it. Um, but the results tend to be predictable. They would be about as predictable as if somebody attempted to make me not be heterosexual and 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 uh, want to be with my wife Jeannie. It would be uh, it would be psychologically damaging and and ridiculously uh, ineffectual. So uh, a lot of times, just kind of a, a shoe on you know you know walk a mile in the other person's shoes, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, really goes pretty pretty long way on some of these issues. Um, if you are heterosexual and determinedly heterosexual and have known that since you were young, ask yourself how you would have responded to sexual orientation change therapy to try to make you be something that you were not. It probably would not have gone very well. And if it was being imposed upon you by your parents, by your pastors, 
um, then the role of that of those beloved and trusted authorities in imposing this kind of psychological distress on you would not have been very very much appreciated. That's part of the trauma. <coughs> Richard. Yes, thank you. Uh, you touched on the dilemma of church leaders, and that's uh, not wanting to divide their congregations by saying what they actually think. Right. Uh, I think you've done it today, sharing your own journey, which has a personal touch about it, which is, which is really very good. But, but I feel that you know, church leaders too often they mistake unity of the church rather than standing in unity with the dispossessed or the exclusive. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, from yeah. your experience, how you can encourage church leaders to be more forward in that and the congregations to be more open to hearing what they have to say. Um, one, that's a very good question and I appreciate it. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why pastors are concerned with the unity of the church. Uh, there's nothing quite as miserable as the church fight, as a schism, as having half of your people leave, including uh, the people, half the, half the dollars as well, right? Um, and all the interpersonal pain and so on, um, there's a lot of reason why, why many, many church leaders are aware that a conversation is coming, that it needs to happen, but, they're, but not yet. Let's try, let's wait, let's wait a little bit longer. If we could wait just a little bit longer, maybe we'll be okay. Um, listening to LGBT people helps here because in a sense you already have uh, casualties of a no-talk policy. You, you have the kids uh, who, who happen to be, or the adults who happen to be uh, sexual or gender minorities and and the not talking about it continues their exclusion and their second class status and so on. Or, or they've left the church. Actually, there's a massive community, I'm convinced of it, of exiled ex-Christians, um, especially among the young, who are more and more leaving either because they are LGBT or because their friends are and they can't stand what the churches are doing to their friends. And so it's both. Um, so there are costs to not having the conversation as well as costs to having the conversation, especially with the generational divide that is showing up all over the world on this issue. Um, so if you have the under 30 crowd um, that, is, that is eager just to get this resolved or at least to have a conversation, if the church remains tentative, then it can, it can delegitimize the church in the eyes of a lot of the younger people who, who are an important part of the church too, right? You know. Um, we can't talk about this really important thing and it's hurting people. Here's my friend or here's me. Um, so why would I, you know, why would I bother with this community, you know? Um, so the pace of, of requests for those of us who have worked on this issue to come in and help midwife some kind of conversation is accelerating and it's all over the world. So something is happening in which the let's not talk about it quite yet move is, is is increasingly giving way to at least a desire for some kind of conversation. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I wish we could have this conversation and move forward either in unity or in agreeing to disagree. Uh, and sometimes it happens that way and sometimes it doesn't. It, it calls on the very best of us to move forward together even if we happen to end up disagreeing on this issue. Teed. Is it practically possible for tolerance and intolerance to coexist? <laughs> Can you have the two ends of the spectrum actually work it out when one end of the spectrum is, is exclusion, is, is, says we can't actually have these people involved in this? Right. I think that if, if you take my spectrum seriously of, of there being at least four approaches um, and and you know so the moderate traditionalist perspective that is really wanting to not be hateful and to be inclusive and have people in the church and and let's talk about it together we are so glad you're here we would never turn you away as a member or something like that 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 is only one step away from the conflicted and two steps away from the full inclusion and I think I think that it is possible uh, 
possible, not inevitable, but possible for that range of diversity to exist in the same congregation. But, but the, um, the really hard line, no, this is, this is a blessing, sin, um, this, is, this is, you know, whatever the, you know, sometimes the language is really quite harsh, right, you know, um, that doesn't coexist very well with, with the positions, at least position three and position four. And um, if you look at the history of Christianity, a lot of our, the birth of new Christian groups has come at a moment when an existing Christian group simply could not come to a common mind. And um, one, way, one place where we saw it in the U.S. is the birth of northern and southern denominations right before the Civil War. They could not come to a common mind on slavery, and so you had northern Presbyterians and southern Presbyterians, northern Baptists and southern Baptists. And the same thing happened over the role of women more recently in my country, uh, related to, like around the 1980s and 90s. You had um, schisms, not as grand as the other, but still, uh, on those that would ordain women and those that wouldn't, or those that would have women as pastors and those that wouldn't. Um, that tends to be the Protestant way. If you disagree, you split. Um, but it is, it is not a very good witness to the world. It weakens us. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of collateral damage in the splitting process. So if there is a way to avoid it, uh, we should try. Uh, my friend Ken Wilson, in his book, Letter to My Congregation, has proposed that this issue should be treated as a disputable matter, Romans 14, which I preached on here on Sunday. And that we could imagine churches in which we agree to live together in community while, while treating this as a secondary disputable matter. What's interesting about that on this issue is those most committed on the one side or the other don't really see this as a disputable matter anymore. They see it as a pivotal matter. On the one side, preventing heresy and sin from creeping into the church anymore. On the other side, preventing further victimization of LGBT people. And if they're not going to be able to see it as a disputable matter, then that really is, is only going to leave those in-between groups, the moderate traditionalist and the conflicted, to be able to see it as a disputable matter. So I'm afraid that this issue is not going to be resolvable as a disputable matter, but that is what Ken Wilson was proposing. It maybe could be that way for a while in a study or transition time. Susan. Your, your first point is very well taken 
And that's what we discovered when, at First Baptist Church in Decatur. Um, these were Baptist lesbian and gay people. They didn't want to go to an Episcopal church or Anglican church where they would be welcome because the Anglican church was not their tradition. They wanted to go to a Baptist church. They wanted to worship in the Baptist way. Um, and so there are a lot of, you might say, internally displaced Christians who are not able to worship in the tradition of their, of their passion, of their preference. Um, and so the best they can do is you know, go to a, especially a lot of times, it, because it's the more progressive congregations that are more open, like they're theologically conservative in every way, they just happen to be gay. But they're not welcome in their home tradition, and so they come to your more progressive church and say, oh, I, you know, this is not my, at least they don't, they don't kick us out, but this is not my tradition. So uh, it's a flock waiting to be welcomed back home in many traditions. Um, yes, uh, on the second question, uh, it's definitely the case when you look at the background to both the uh, ancient Hebrew rejection uh, of uh, male same-sex activity, which is what was the only one that is mentioned in the Old Testament, and certainly in the Greco-Roman context, um, the pervasive patriarchy of those societies must be taken seriously. And uh, the studies of, of Greco-Roman culture reveal that that sex was something that a more powerful person did to a less powerful person. That's what sex was. And so any man who would submit to be the passive partner in sex um, was degrading his manliness because he was being allowing himself to be treated like a woman. And so um, this, this is important in understanding the, the, the background in the Greco-Roman world where most same-sex activity involved the domination of a more, a, by a more powerful person of a less powerful person, male or female, um, in terms of um, sex in general, but same-sex in particular. And, and in contemporary psychology, <clears throat> when you, see, well, you know what happens to that boy on the playground who's not manly, who's not masculine. He is simultaneously called a woman or some denigra denigrating term for, for a gay person. And so it's about images of masculinity, effeminacy, and so on. And in fact, the word that is translated, one of the words that is translated homosexual in modern English translations in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, is the word malakoi from malakos, which, which is more, um, more probably more directly or, or clearly uh, translated as soft. And in older translations of the Bible, English Bible, the, the King James has it as effeminate. So, so it is quite possible that the better translation of, of that vice list term in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is effeminate. And it gets to men who don't adequately masculinize themselves are questionable in social cultural understanding of what it means to be male and what it means to be female, man, woman. Um, and so then sex gets all wrapped up in that. So thank you for your question. Paul. Um, not a lot of good news there. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to church. It's been cool, you know. Um, uh, I don't run into that too much in the States. Uh, I guess it's there. Um, but the, I'll, I'll jump on the, the born that way piece. Um, two things I want to say about that. One is... Um, there is still an awful lot of theological squirming about what to make of um, about people's sexuality and whether it is kind of fixed or whether it is more fluid. Same with gender. And, um, 
And it, even if it is fixed, what to make of that? Uh, and there's an aspect of Christian theology that so much wants to believe that there is nothing in a human being if they really want to change it and it's not pleasing to God. If they, if they pray enough, if they have other people praying for them, they can be transformed. And so, um, and that's still very, very persuasive to people unless they have been on this journey with a lot of LGBT people who have tried and tried and tried and tried and they, they cannot have the transformation that they're seeking. Um, I, I, have, I have in my notes here pages of correspondence from people. You know, one of them is, um, I literally broke my teeth praying night after night, you know, God change me, God change me. So part of what we're dealing with here is the mystery of those aspects of our lives that cannot be changed no matter how much we wish they could be changed. Um, the, um, the consigning of people like that, the theological consigning of people like that, whether in that pure Calvinist way or any other way, to, well, you're messed up. I guess there's nothing that you can do about it, but there's nothing we can do to make a place for you in the life of the church on equal terms with others. I don't understand that as a gospel practice. Um, I understand how somebody could get there, but it doesn't feel very Jesus-y to me. Um, and I want to follow Jesus. So at that point, you're dealing with gut, and that's why I talked last night about kingdom and Jesus. Immerse, immerse yourself in Jesus, his example, his teaching, his ministry. Of course, that doesn't resolve everything. Then people come back with Jesus stories, you know, whatever. But, but I ultimately have not been able to hold on to a view that offers no hope to such a person, either in this life or especially in the life to come. You've made my night by an international renowned theologian saying doesn't feel very Jesus-y. Jesus-y, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's... How you spell that is up for grabs, I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah. Fiona. Thank you. My question is about children. Yes. Right. Um... I think that um, I think that there are an awful lot of unwanted children in the world. Um, not as many as there used to be before uh, abortion was as widespread a practice as it now is. Uh, and I think that that a, a lesbian couple or a gay couple that wants to raise a child and can take a child from an orphanage or from an abusive situation or a foster situation that is unstable or temporary to make that child their child and to raise them in their, in their best way that they know how to do uh, is an improvement for that child. And, um, and so I certainly would not be opposed to the placing of children with gay or lesbian couples. The reproductive technology issue is um, is complicated because of the complexities of reproductive technology. Um, I, I think it's interesting that, that for, for so, so many things in this world, we want a technological solution. And I've actually been teaching about reproductive technology for as long as I've been teaching about these other issues. And I, I'm, I appreciate the good gift that reproductive technology has made possible for many, many couples. Um, but it is also a, a path uh, with an awful lot of expense and hardship and heartbreak for those for whom it does not work. And so I try not to, uh, I try to, when I counsel with couples, I try to encourage them to be realistic about the difficulties both of the adoption path and of the reproductive technology path. But I think morally the reproductive technology path is a little murkier than the adoption path. Um, but it's not a hard and fast, you know, absolutely wrong thing from my perspective. Um, I do think that there are benefits in the, in the, to, the, to children to have both male and female role models in the home. Um, and, um, but I also think that, that two loving parents for somebody who has zero loving parents is a vast improvement. And so uh, if it's possible to to you know, kind of affirm things that many people think are contradictory. I mean, I don't think that's contradictory. It's like, this is good, this is better, or this is good, this is pretty good. All of it is better than the alternative for many children. 
And I also have a lot of personal experience now of, of seeing loving parents, loving gay and lesbian parents that work with their own children. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. So that's what I would say. So. What are you doing? Yeah, it's a good question. So what, what does one find in Genesis 1 and 2 that could be helpful? And I think that's an important question, and here's what I would say. Um, Genesis 2 in particular speaks to the hunger of people for a partner. Adam in the Genesis 2 story is wandering around the garden pretty lonely, right? And God brings him, you know, aardvarks and zebras and, and all of that. And he names them A to Z. And um, that's pretty cool for a while, you know. Uh, a to Z. Okay, you all so, say Z here. Um, but still there was not found uh, a partner suitable for him. Eitzer Konegdo, something like that in Hebrew. It's not my, my native language. But there's a, a suitable partner for him. And so God made him a suitable partner for him. That language of a suitable partner has some potential. Um, a suitable partner who, who eases our loneliness, who goes through life with us, with whom one is sexually intimate, with whom one is relationally intimate, with whom one raises a family if gifted with children, um, with whom one works side by side, uh, most people in the world are looking for somebody like that. Um, but they're looking for somebody suitable for them. So what the church has told uh, lesbian and gay people is, um, we don't acknowledge that you also need a partner suitable for you. Or, if we acknowledge that you want a partner suitable for you, that partner is not suitable from our perspective. And so we will not bless your effort to find a partner suitable for you. Um, so, so many gay and lesbian people have been driven to marriages under false pretenses or to, uh, to attempt to be something that they're not or to live as celibate or not celibate but single, right? No, no sanctioned option leading to no good possibilities. Nowadays, where a lot of the conversation has gone in the States is Okay, we acknowledge gay people exist. We acknowledge gay Christians exist. We acknowledge we've treated them pretty badly. We need to do better. But we will not acknowledge that they ought to be able to be able to have a partner like we can. And so we counsel celibacy for every single gay Christian. And, um, and I remember that Martin Luther uh, said, not one in a thousand people can live a celibate life. We're asking a thousand out of a thousand gay and lesbian people to live a celibate life. And then we are not, we are surprised when they don't really want that advice. Um, so, so I think that the bone of bone, flesh of flesh, by the way, that language also speaks to kinship. I think it was James Brownson who pointed out that bone of bone, flesh of flesh, one flesh, if you look at the Hebrew, other uses of that language, it's at least as much about kinship and family as it is about sex. So, you know, when you, when you, um, when you marry somebody and it really sticks, and, you know, you become their closest family member, and then they become your closest family member, you leave your home family and you become family with them. Gay and lesbian people want that too, a lot of them do. And, um, and so the one flesh concept and uh, a helper suitable, speaking to the holistic interpersonal desires of just about everybody on the planet, uh, I think is a very constructive resource for this issue. And I'm really glad you asked that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, maybe just one last question, Dane. Thank you. But I'd love to into so a common sort of art argument that we put out by some people around this issue is that for the church to be silent on the on the issue of same sex relationships is for being to silent the oppressor. 
And you talk about being silent, not, not methods or not working in this talk. So yeah. I was wondering, the question here is, what would be your advice to parishioners of church who feel that their church either hasn't engaged with this issue enough or has been silent on it? Mm. Um, I would say, <laughs> I would say, have some mercy on your weary pastors. Um, uh, understand uh, what it looks like from their from their perspective, which is this could be uh, a congregation splitting, job losing proposition for them. So have some mercy, have some patience, um, but. The time, the time may come when, when you conclude we, we really need to have this conversation and there may be others who agree with you and so go respectfully to the elders or the deacons or the pastoral leadership of the church and say, can we have this conversation at least? Can we read together? Can we, can we look at maybe this book called Changing Our Mind? Maybe that, you know, or, or another one. Can, can we begin having some congregational conversations? Can, can, can we at least in the silence. Um, different congregations are doing this in different ways. Some are in long study processes. We'll spend five years reading everything on this issue. I mean, that's better than silence, I think. Others, it's, it's happening much more quickly. I would urge all church leaders not to focus on policy at first. Policy is not where you want to focus. You want to focus on, on uh, people and on reading and learning and, and getting up to speed on the conversation. Policy is what divides um, pastoral care tends to unite. So thinking about how to minister to everybody who, who we need to minister to. Now, there are uh, many young people, especially that I, and others, who, who after a while, they're not willing to wait any longer. And so what they sometimes do is they start leaving too. They leave to go to churches in which the conversation has already been resolved or in which it's really happening. So if that's, where you are then, then, and that's where you are in good conscience, you might need to say that too. Um, uh, I feel like we need to have this conversation. I need to be in a church that is able to have this conversation. I need you to know that I may not be able to stay if, if we don't sometime soon have this conversation. Honest communication. It all goes into the overall feedback that the leaders of the church are receiving, and then they process it prayerfully and discerningly and, uh, and make the best decisions that they can. This whole issue needs to be bathed in prayer. Merely secular, partisan, politicking type stuff on this issue will kill any church that tackles it. Let love prevail, bathe this issue in prayer, and, um, and follow Jesus. And I think we can move forward on this issue as we have on so many others. So thank you very much. I do want to just detain you a little bit longer because tonight is the, is the last of what has been a, a quite special week as we've um, had David and Jeannie here with us and sharing uh, a, a lot of their time and energy uh, and time away from the people that they love most. So we're, we've been uh, mightily blessed by having you here with us. We're very grateful. Uh, we've appreciated the time that you've given. We've appreciated that you've come together and done that, and that's been special uh, to see as well. And we've been privileged to get to know you uh, and become friends. Um, I think it's fair to say that you have a home away from home here in Wellington. The weather has been rubbish <laughs> while you've been here. That's important to say. I've, some people are trying to say, I think they're Aucklanders, are trying to say that it's typical, but it's not. And, uh, and as you prepare to go to Auckland tomorrow morning, um, don't believe the lies that they tell you. <laughs> we hope that, uh, that your time in Auckland is, is, is uh, a, a special time as well, and uh, as you then head, uh, head on the long journey back home. I also wanted to take the opportunity to um, uh, just thank uh, those who have been involved in, in making uh, David and Jeannie's visit possible 
um, this week to my um, fellow collaborators in the organising group, particularly uh, Jeff Troughton, uh, Chris Marshall, Annie Mercer, Rob Anderson. Thank you to you for all months and months of work. To all who have shown hospitality, who have helped make uh, the public lectures possible and served those in many other ways and other events in many ways. And to all of you who have come and participated in these conversations to hear uh, from David's insight and expertise and to engage with what he has to share. Thank you. So David, I'm sure that your influence uh, here will be enduring, may even be eternal influence. Uh, but uh, in conclusion to this visit uh, and to your time with us, we wanted to, to give you a gift. Uh, and I wonder, Jeff, if you would, um, HR, uh, you sit, sit down, because <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, would you mind um, giving that to Jeannie, I think? She's probably the best person to take uh, that. We don't want to embarrass you by uh, having you come up, but, uh, but Jeannie, thank you for coming to New Zealand with your husband, and uh, God bless you both as you return back home uh, in, the, in the next few days. Well, we have had a, a wonderful visit, and thanks to all of you who've come. Is there anybody who has been to every single evening lecture? Like, what's wrong with you people? That's my question. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you for enduring, uh, enduring uh, these lectures over these nights. God bless you all here. I do, I do hope we can come back, especially when the weather is better. Um, <laughs> can I close this in prayer? Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you for uh, places like this church in which uh, serious uh, biblical, theological, pastoral reflection as possible. Protect the vitality and health of this church and other churches in this community that are, are striving to be kingdom churches, Christ-centered churches, pastorally sensitive churches, publicly engaged churches. Strengthen the church in New Zealand, Lord. Strengthen the witness of your people. Unite the church here and, and also unite the church's efforts with all people of goodwill who are committed to the well-being of this community and especially the needs of those who are most marginalized and who suffer most profoundly. Um, Lord, may, uh, may the church in New Zealand and in Wellington in particular uh, bear radiant witness to your love uh, and, and to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless each one who has come. Return them to their homes in peace and safety and may they be faithful witnesses for you in days to come. Amen.